Bibles. Uh, to Philippians, if you guys have your Bible apps, go for it. Uh, Philippians chapter 3. Um, so the big takeaway for all of this is humility. Um, and last week we talked about Jesus, how even though he is God, he did not consider equality with the Father uh, something to be grasped, but rather he humbled himself. And, and this is the calling for each and every one of us. Uh, that we embrace that kind of humility and, and to know and to understand that it is actually in our surrender to God and God moving and working in us that we're able to actually live and experience the life we actually want to live. That God's promised life of the abundant life isn't actually depending on our ability to be holy or our ability to be smart and, you know, all of these things to study the Bible, but it, it is actually in our ability to surrender. And, and, and so this is kind of a weird uh, thing because in the world, it is all about you, what you do and, and how you do it. And, and, and so you have to be holy and so you have to be smart and you have to connect the dots and all of these things and whatnot. But in the kingdom of God, it is actually, it is actually as we grow in our dependence of God uh, that we actually mature. It is that as we fully surrender to his ways that we are actually able to become more and more like Jesus. And, and so it's a weird thing that we both need to kind of apply our effort, as it were, but it's actually applying our effort in surrendering to God. Because our temptation is to take the wheel. But like the song says, you know, like, take the wheel. Right? And, and that's actually what, what we're trying to do. Um, and so here in chapter 3 of Philippians, uh, we continue kind of in that mode. And so here we see Paul um, talking about himself and uh, putting no confidence in the flesh. So Philippians chapter 3, starting from verse uh, 1. Further, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. It is no trouble for me to write the same things to you again, it, and it is a safeguard for you. So one of the great things about leaning on God, about humility and trusting in Jesus, is that we can actually rejoice. This is one of the secrets of, you know, of, of, of really like falling in love with Jesus. It is because the pressure is off. When I'm trying to live this good life and I'm trying to be everything that you know, God wants me to be, and I'm doing it, the pressure is on. You know, I got to be a good son. I got to be a good daughter. I got to get a good job. I got to marry well. I got to have kids. I got to, you know, uh, get a house or a decent car or dress well, like, you know, just so that my parents can be proud and all of these things. But that's like pressure. That's more and more and more and more pressure that I have to put on myself and then I have to somehow achieve. But in the kingdom of God, all that pressure is actually on God. That's why Jesus said, you know, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. All we really need to do and really focus on is Jesus. And as we press in and as we continue to surrender and as we continue to obey, it's Jesus that provides everything else that we need or we want or that we are actually looking for. And if that's true, and if there's no pressure, then we can actually rejoice. Because God is good. Because God is faithful. 
and he is trustworthy. And that's where our hope is. And that's why Paul says, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. Because God's timing is perfect. And because he's the faithful father and a loving father, he will give us everything that we need in its proper time. And so, verse 2, watch out for those dogs, those evildoers, those mutilators of the flesh. This is where Paul gets mad, okay? And he, he gets fired up. Why? Because he's here Talk. who are the dogs, who are the evildoers, who are the mutilators of the flesh? Here, Paul is talking about, um, so you guys all know that Christianity came out as a sect of the Jewish faith, right? And so even here, there's a very um, close tie between uh, kind of proper Judaism and Orthodox Jews and these Jesus followers that are Jews, but they also believe in Jesus as the Messiah, and, you know, they don't get circumcised, you know, and they hang out with Gentiles, and they, you know, do all these other things. And so the Orthodox Jews and, and Jewish Christians uh, are kind of pursuing this fledgling early church that, hey, 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 okay, you're going to believe in Jesus as the Messiah, right? That's a Jewish term, right? The Jewish Messiah, right? Well, you got to then follow the Jewish rules, right? You have to be circumcised. You have to follow all these rules and regulations. But Paul here is super, super adamant that no, in Christ Jesus, what he has done on that cross is enough, right? We don't have to follow the religious regulations of, of circumcision and all of these things because there's no salvation in those things, right? But for the Jew, it's like you got to follow every rule and every regulation. And if you break one, if you miss one, if you skip one, then you've actually, you know, technically broken them all. And that's why there's no salvation in the law in and of itself, right? And that's why we need Jesus. And so Paul continues, for it is we who are the circumcision, we who serve God by his spirit, who boast in Christ Jesus and who put no confidence in the flesh. Okay, So it has nothing to do with what we can do in our own flesh. Uh, Paul is saying, but, you know, there's true circumcision that Jesus does, and that's in our hearts, and that's in our lives. And so he goes on, though I myself have re reasons for such confidence. If someone else thinks they have a reason to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. And so here Paul starts to begin to kind of name his kind of religious standing. You know, if, you're, if we're going to get religious and legalistic about this, right, this is, this is what I have, guys. Right? And he tells everybody that he's the cream of the crop circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law of Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church, as for righteousness based on the law, faultless. Okay? He is describing himself here as the perfect Jew. Okay? It's like you guys are coming at us like this, that, oh, you got to follow. The okay, let's talk about that. Right? If you want to compare resumes, I'm the perfect Jew, right? Look at all of my standings here. Look at this. I am circumcised. I'm a Pharisee. Look, I even persecuted the church and all of these things. I am faultless when it comes to the law. But what does he say? Verse 7, but whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. And what does he say? I consider them garbage. Okay, And I think the term here in the Greek is actually very strong. It's like poo-stained rags, right? It's 
something that you're going to avoid at all cost. That I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ. A righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. So even though Paul has all of these things going for him as a Jew, as this religiously zealous person, he said, in Christ Jesus, none of that matters. And he actually considers, considers all of those things a loss in comparison to who Jesus is. And this is the beauty of the gospel, that through the grace of God, the Bible can make sense to little kids. That the gospel's message can be understood by the illiterate. And, and not just the wealthy. Not just the ultra smart. And, and, and whatever we think that we have here on earth that is to our benefit, in the kingdom of God, it can actually be a loss. And not just a loss, but a liability. Right? Because we can stand on our own wisdom. We can stand on our own family name and background and wealth and all of these things. Right? Like, these are my safety net. Rather than Jesus. And you're going to find that when you go through life, capable strong, self-sufficient, you're going to have a hard time experiencing that. Until you get to that point where you're at the end of your ropes and you realize that, hey, I can't actually do this on my own. And you're able to see that and you're able to come to God and ask Him for help, that's when the switch turns. That's when the transformation turns. The church it is not about people who are capable, people who are smart, people who are well put together, and you know, and all of these things who have it together. The church is about people who are broken. People who see that, man, I need Jesus. And I need Jesus more. And it is those people that actually will be able to see God. You guys remember in um, um, the Beatitudes, right? It's the poor in spirit that, that'll see God. It's the peacemaker. It's all of these things. It's not the things that the world is looking for, right? But it's these things that God is looking for that will actually draw us closer to God. You want to see God? You want to experience God? You want to feel the power of God at work in your life? You need to humble yourself. So long as you're good, so long as I got this, then you're good. You got this. You don't need God. But if you want God and his power at work in your life, then you're going to be like Paul and realize, oh man, all of these things that I thought were to my advantage is actually to my loss. It's actually hindering me from humbling myself and being able to come to God and see that I need him. Right? Moses, in the Bible it says, <laughs> it's a funny thing because it's actually in the book that Moses wrote, Right? But it's not that Moses wrote this about himself, right? An editor did, but, you know, in, I think it's in Exodus or something, but it says, you know, Moses was the humblest man on the earth, right? Now, if Moses wrote that, then, you know, I don't know. But, um, but, you know, Moses was the prince of Egypt, right? He was the most well-educated person in all of Israel, you know, at that time, in all of these things. But the Bible says he was the most humble. It took him 80 years of humiliation and then humility. 
Humiliation is when you are, when, when you're giving humility. Okay? If I want to give you humility, what do I do? I humiliate you. But if I want humility, then I'm going to humble myself. And God says he opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Moses was driven away, right, from the palace after he murders somebody, takes matters into his own hands. Because again, he feels this call that he's supposed to help save his people, the Hebrews. But he ends up murdering somebody. And then now he's an outcast. And so living in a country that's far away from where he was and all of that, for 40 years, he had his own kind of personal desert experience. And he was humble. And then he humbled himself. And then at 80 years, that's when God decides to use him to bring Israel out of it. And, and so God wants to move and work in each of your lives. And the dreams and the hopes that you guys have are a, 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 a tiny taste and a tiny glimpse of the calling that's on your life. But we can either take that calling and do it ourselves, like Moses, and end up murdering somebody, right? We have good intentions. We always have good intentions, but the road to hell is paved with good intentions, it says. Or we can surrender that calling to God and let him resurrect it. All Moses was able to do with his passion and zeal and the vision that he had was to kill one uh, Egyptian and not be able to rescue any Hebrews. Surrender to God, he was able to rescue all of Israel by the grace of God, right? And through God, punish the Egyptians for the thing that they did. And, and so that's what's coming to you guys right now, is that whatever hopes and dreams you guys have, bring it before the Lord. Lay it before him and ask God, you put this on my heart, but what do I do with it? How do I make it real? Like, how do I make this work? I don't know how, but would you show me? Right? And go on that journey with God. Um, continuing on, uh, verse 10. I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. So one of the things I want you guys to know clearly that the Christian life isn't meant to be easy. It is exciting. It is powerful. You will see crazy and awesome things in your life, but it is not meant to be easy. Okay? You will suffer. The primary mode of suffering is the death of our our own will, our own desire, our own appetites in this world. Right? Jesus says, if any person would follow me, you must deny yourself. Carry your cross and daily follow me. Right? And in order for us to do that, that's actively putting death to our flesh, right? It, it could be good things that we want, but putting that to death and then seeking after what it is that God can do, right? And in that is suffering. It's like working out, right? You're destroying your muscle, the muscles that you had to create new muscles. You're destroying your old desires to create new desires. Old habits die so that you can create new habits. Right? You suffer and you die so that you can be resurrected. And, and this is what Paul is saying, that all he wants is Christ. 
to be. He wants to experience the suffering and the resurrection. He knows that there has to be a death in order for there to be a resurrection. And, and so this is where, you know, if you guys haven't died yet, you haven't experienced the resurrection and the power and the new life in Christ Jesus. Right? If you're continuing to live your old life and wondering, hey, where's the power of God? Where's the blessing of God in my life? That's not how it works. Right? It is once we put to death our own desires, our own ways, our own will, and we take up cross and God's ways and God's will, that's when we actually will begin to experience new life and the power of God. And so verse 12, not that I have already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Okay? And, and so this is where the, the striving is, you know? It is in the pressing on. Pressing on to Jesus. Pressing on to the things of God. And, and, and cutting off all of the things from my former life. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead. I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. One of the things that we have to realize is Jesus says that when he returns, he's coming back with rewards. Okay? And, and so I hope you guys don't think that, oh, rewards are bad. That, you know, how you live your life here on earth, God is going to reward you accordingly. Right? And, and so I, I don't want you guys to miss out on your rewards. The more you guys press into God, the more you guys invest into the kingdom of God, the more of a return you're going to get. Right? The disciples who are following Jesus, God, what's going to happen to us? Right? We left homes and fields and families and all of these things. And Jesus says, yeah, you know what? All of you who have left all of these things for my name's sake, hundredfold. Right? You're going to get in return a hundredfold. I want you to know that God is love, God is just, God is fair, and, and God is not going to be indebted to anybody. Right? So that when you, at the end, when you're before him, you're going to be able to say, God, you owe me. Right? God doesn't live and work like that. Right? But he knows as a good father that, yeah, you know what? Oh, man, look at all this thing that, that you sacrificed. Look at all of this obedience. Look at all the, these things you laid down for me. You know what? I'm going to bless you even more. That's how God moves and works and operates. But too many of us, we live life as if mm, we're running out of resources. You know, that God is poor and, and we are poor. And, and so I have to be very stingy with what I have. But Jesus says, no, be generous, right? When you sow seeds, sow generously so that you can reap generously. And all of these things that we do, we're not to do out of our own um, compulsions, right? Oh, I should or I whatever. But everything that we do, we're called to do out of obedience. And that's the difference I want you guys to um, really understand in your life. Your life is about obedience, not sacrifice. There will be room for sacrifice, but Jesus says, you know, God says to obey is better than sacrifice. And, and to many of us, sacrifice is duty. You know, like a good son, like a good daughter, I'm willing to sacrifice. But the thing is, when you sacrifice, Oftentimes, we can close our hearts. We can close our hearts, and we can just sacrifice. We can have no love in our heart, no desire for God, but we can still sacrifice. But that's not what God wants, because the biggest thing that God wants is your heart. And so this is where obedience comes in. We obey with our hearts open. I want to do what you want me to do. Right? Because I love you. And, and so here Paul, you know, he's saying, you know, pretty much follow my example. 
And what Paul is doing isn't sacrificing, he is obeying because he loves the Lord. Uh, verse 15, all of us then who are mature should take such a view of things. And if on some point you think differently, that too, that God will make clear to you. Only let us live up to what we have already attained. Join together in following my example, brothers and sisters. And just as you have as a model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. Okay, for as I have often told you before and now tell you again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Okay, and this is true even in the church. Okay, that we can live as enemies of the cross. We can be religious Christians, but really have nothing to do with Christ. Really have nothing to do with the heart of the Father. We just go to church because we feel like, oh, if I go to church, God will bless me. And all I want is just God to bless me. I don't care about God. I don't, whatever he wants to do, he's going to do. I don't really care. I just want the blessing, right? And many of us kind of can live and, and experience or try to experience God in that way. But, um, but what God wants isn't just to use you. What God wants is to be in relationship with you. Um, verse 19, their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stomach and their glory is in their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things. Okay? And so for those that love God, our minds and our hearts are set on heavenly things, on the things that God wants. And those that do not, then our minds are set on earthly things, right? And it is about our own appetites, our own desires, what I want, right? How am I going to fulfill my desires and my hopes and my dreams? And here Paul says, if that's how you live, then your destiny is destruction, right? And, and destruction is not something new. It's not something like, you know, oh, okay, I'm going to destroy you. We're all headed towards destruction, right? That, that's the way of the world. We go in the way of the world. It is headed towards destruction. But it is by the grace of God that we're being plucked out, right? And then we have a different destination and we have a different destiny. And so as we continue to live without God or kind of continue to live according to our own flesh, you know, we're continuing down that path of destruction. But our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. Okay? And we know that this is Paul's hope, right? He, he's looking forward, looking towards that. When Jesus was resurrected, he had a new resurrected body and he was able to like what go through walls and just kind of show up and disappear and, and, and whatnot. Right. Um, and, and that's what Paul is looking forward to. And that's what we all have to look forward to is the complete renewal of all things. And so humility is the key. Jesus embodied and embraced humility. And the call is for us to do the same. Yes, God has given some of you wisdom. Yes, some of you have been given wealth. Some of you have been given status. Some of you have been given, you know, all of these things. Don't despise it, but hold it in proper regard that these are not defining things. But these are blessings from God, right? And as I have received freely, that I can freely give as well, right? And yet we learn to live with open hands. That God can give us whatever he wants and God can take whatever he wants. But don't live close-fisted. That, oh man, you know, this is all I have. Even if I let go, I'm not going to have anything. Because remember what God wants to do with our lives is to 
right? Give me everything that you have in your hands, and I will give you everything I have in my hands, right? And I promise you that what God has in his hands is far greater and far better than what you have in your hands. And so live life with open hands towards God. Let him take and let him give. And continue to trust in God. Continue to depend on God. Continue to cry out to God. Continue to rejoice in God. Everything that you do, live and have your being with God. That's what he wants. Just daily communion with God. Not like, okay, God, tell me what you want me to do. Okay, good. Now I'm going to go run off and do it. That's not what he wants. He wants to come with you. He wants you to actually go with him. And, and so that's the kind of relationship that God is calling you towards and calling you in. And, and so I want you to know that there is so much to the Christian life that is available even today. Many of us, we don't experience it because like what Paul said, you know, our stomach is our God and, you know, we live at the level of comfort and convenience, right? Many of us live as cultural Christians. That I, I'm Christian by name, but if you look at me and how I operate and what I look at and how I think and how I live and what my desires are, I'm just like the rest of you, right? Yeah, you can call me Muslim. You can call me whatever, you know, put a label on me. I don't care, but I'm just one of you, right? That's how many of us live. And living like that, that's why we don't experience it. We don't experience the power of God. But there are miracles happening today. People receiving healings, people being resurrected, people... Right? And that is available in your life today. But we need to humble ourselves. Let God fill us. And then you'll begin to see. You know, when we live according to the way He wants us to live, then we're going to see Him show us Himself. You want to see God, you want to experience God more, you want to experience the power of God in your life, humble yourself. Seek after Him wholeheartedly. Pursue Him wholeheartedly. Consider everything else in your life garbage for the sake of Christ. Make Jesus your primary goal your primary reason for living, and your primary pursuit. It doesn't mean you have to quit, give up your dreams, and, you know, become a monk in a desert and, you know, live like a hermit, right? But there is a way we order our lives where we put God first, and everything else just kind of loosely fits in there. And depending on what God wants to do with it, we allow him to shift. Today, he wants me to be an accountant, then that's what I am today. But in a month, if he wants me to be a missionary, okay. Following that, he wants me to be a business person, okay. Right? Living with God is not predictable, but it is, it is exciting. And you will see God and his faith. Father God in heaven, we thank you so much for who you are and for all that you are doing, Lord. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you are not calling us to just be religious. You are not desiring us to be mm, just knowing about you and just kind of showing up and going through some religious activity and motions. But Lord God, that what you actually desire is our heart. 
that you want all of us, Lord God, inside out. And that when we are willing and able to lay down ourselves completely before you, Lord God, that you are offering the fullness of yourself to us. And so, Lord Jesus, my prayer is that my brothers and sisters here, they will all taste and see that you are good. That, Lord God, that you would stoke in their hearts, Lord God, that deep desire, that deep hunger, Lord God, for eternal things, for the things of you, Lord God. That you would call them um, to look heavenward, Lord God, to lift their eyes, Lord God, from the things of this world to begin to desire and long after and seek after the things of you, Lord Jesus. And so, Lord God, help them to humble themselves and, and pursue you wholeheartedly, Lord God. And as you do, Lord Jesus, may you do amazing uh, things in their lives that you would use them in miraculous ways, Lord God. Holy Spirit, I pray and ask that you would remind them of your love, remind them of your faithfulness, remind them how much you have been already at work in their lives, Lord God. And may you draw them back to you, Jesus. And may you help them to hunger after, thirst after, Lord God, the things of you, Lord Jesus. And so we thank you, Lord God. Help us to deny ourselves. Help us to take up our cross and help us to follow you on a daily basis, Lord God. And help us to remember that you are good and that you are faithful. And help us to put our hope and our trust in you, Lord Jesus. And that when we cry out, that you will hear us. And so we thank you, and in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.